to this lovely space. So thanks for having me. This is my favorite kind of talk to give. Um, so today I'll talk about supporting the data science lifecycle. Um, so there's a lot of change afoot, of course, uh, across the campus, across the sciences, but even at home for us in Soda Hall in the computer science department. Um, so, uh, and, and this, you know, this change, obviously, in this context, I'm talking about centers around the uh, ample use of data. So when I came to Berkeley, even, uh, and I'm a, I'm a young guy by many standards, uh, in the 90s, uh, my field, database research, was considered something of a backwater. You know, computer science was about computing. It was about calculations. And people who worked on data were some sort of practical people who maybe should only be in industry. To give you a, a metric on this, at the time that I was interviewing at Berkeley, MIT didn't have databases because it really wasn't an academic uh, pursuit from their perspective. So this has changed, obviously, enormously uh, over the last 20 odd years that I've been on the faculty here, which is great. Um, one of the things that was interesting, though, about us being sort of a backwater at the time was we were both sort of a microcosm and a macrocosm of computer science. We were a microcosm in the sense that we were free to work on whatever we wanted. Um, because we were building these full stack uh, uh, computer science solutions for working with data. So we would think about language design and we would think about optimization and we would think about systems and we would think about logic and how it applies to computing. And you know, our field, the field of databases, really covered the range of computer science, which is what attracted me to it in uh, graduate school. And at the same time, it was sort of a macrocosm of computer science, because in the 90s, we were the part of academic computer science that interfaced with other disciplines, uh, typically with business users, actually, and with the industry. So we had users and use cases that informed the community since the 1970s. This, of course, was the thing that bugged the academics uh, in the 90s, the sort of pure academics. Um, but we always sort of saw that there was stuff outside of computer science that should be driving our agenda. And so that's sort of in my roots, which is great. And I'm seeing that kind of change happening across computing over the last many years. And so data science is the new kid on the block, uh, both on campus and uh, as we see it, you know, um, sort of introspectively from computing, there's this strong imperative for those of us who've been in computing to connect to other disciplines and to share expertise back and forth uh, with the other disciplines and share problems. Um, I think the thing, though, that's been so striking for me in the last few years, and I'll talk about it in the next few slides, is the shift in computer science from formal science to experimental science. I came into the field sort of enjoying the mathematical and to some degree engineering aspects of computing. We were building things out of whole cloth from first principles and designing systems. But in the last number of years, what we're seeing, especially in the AI branches of computing, is that there's a great deal of experimental science going on. The computer science has really shifted quite a lot. Many of my colleagues, and certainly the grad students who are doing the legwork, are doing tons of experiments these days. And a lot of it is empirical work rather than sort of engineering work. So that's a huge change. So I want to talk about that a bit. Um, and you know, this is a scenario I presented to some of the grad students and our sponsors of the RISE Lab. You know, you have a, a, some Berkeley graduate students are hanging out one night there, of course, you know, young and attractive and brilliant. And they're talking about what you talk about at parties in Berkeley. You know, one of them says, you know, AI is more like experimental science than engineering these days. It's, it's, you know, it's not even really related to math. It's mostly experimentation, um, you know, to which one of uh, her colleagues says, well, I mean, yeah, you can say that, but it's not like a new thing to say. It's so uh, 1995. You know, this is not a new observation. Herb Simon had a paper in the AI journal back in 95, AI and empirical science. So this is really not a new thing. Uh, in some sense, AI has thought of itself as empirical for a long time. But it's increasingly timely. We have all these toolkits for deep learning uh, and other forms of AI these days where people are able to take large data sets, uh, take off-the-shelf software, and begin to train models in various domains. Uh, and really what these people are doing to a great degree is just experimental science of trying out parameters and configurations of known models for new problems. All right, the implications, of course, are entering the popular culture. And uh, as we're getting uh, AI solutions that can do very interesting things, and we're finding those solutions empirically, people are asking, can you explain why the AI is making these decisions? Right? So explainable AI is a theme that's not only important in research, but it makes it into the New York Times. You know, what, what do you do when your AI can't explain its decisions? Um, and all the more so, and again, New York Times, when that AI is itself generating software. Right? So now we've got software generating software, and we can't at any of these levels of the stack explain necessarily why things work. It's just empirically, it seems to. Okay, So it's a new era for computer science in a lot of ways. If you view it, this is software by experimentation. Uh, and so these software artifacts that we're building, they're generated, these models are generated, they're generated from big data, certainly. Right? And that's been a huge change. But 
It's actually more than that, which has been very interesting for me to sort of put my nose into. I didn't really sort of feel this till recently. Uh, computation is being used to generate far more data in some sense than the data we're already gathering. So we're taking our data sets and we're using techniques like resampling to get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of views of a data set in every computation we do. We're using a great deal of uh, search and optimization in our techniques. So we're just basically using computation to try out lots of things that didn't exist before. Uh, and then interestingly, we're also in many cases, like in reinforcement learning, using simulation of physical processes to say what would happen if I did something. Well, I can't test all my processes in the real world, so I'll simulate them. So we're actually simulating realities that don't even happen and then measuring the results of our simulations. Uh, and then finally, all this is feeding into techniques like programming language synthesis, where software is auto-generated. Uh, literally, code is generated uh, by algorithm. Okay, and so you're getting all these things that are generating things that generate data. Um, and this is all being overseen by, you know, people turning knobs, tweakers. I, I mean, they're actually uh, AI developers, right? This is their job, is to um, kind of turn the knobs on all these techniques and see what pops out the other end. All right, and, you know, what do we get from all this experimental work? Well, uh, people have questions about this. You get these models, and some people want to know if they're explainable, all right? Um, I don't know if that's a reasonable thing to ask. Um, are you explainable? Right? Very often you make decisions and, and you might be hard pressed to say why. Uh, and, and even when you go to sort of legislative bodies in Europe and stuff that demand um, explainability, when you dig into it, they're asking for something more prosaic, something more engineering oriented, which I think makes sense. Um, is what you do auditable? Uh, can we track all the things that you did and all the steps of your decision making? Is what you do reliable? Will it continue to do what it does on a regular basis? If it's broke, can you fix it? Is it fixable? These might be questions that are maybe a little less philosophical than are you explainable, but certainly more approachable. So these are all questions that I think are important for us to look at. Um, and all this conversation as we were sort of noodling this around in our heads reminded me of something, which is um, um, my, one of my mentors and inspirations, Jim Gray's fourth paradigm of science. So Jim, as you may know, is the first PhD in computer science from UC Berkeley, a Turing Award winner and one of the founders of my field of database systems. And he had this uh, you know, effort towards the end of his life where he was promoting the use of data as a way to do science that was new. So we had empirical science, theoretical science, recently introduced computational science, and he said, hey, look, the gathering of large volumes of data is the next sort of uh, leg of the stool, if you will, four-legged stool uh, of science. So uh, many of his colleagues after he died contributed to this book. Um, but one of the last talks he gave uh, began this way. We, and it's in the book. Uh, we have to do better at producing tools to support the whole research cycle, from data capture and data curation to data analysis and data visualization. Today, 2007, the tools for capturing data both at the mega scale and at the milliscale are just dreadful. After you've captured the data, you need to curate it before you can start doing any kind of data analysis and we lack good tools for both data curation and data analysis. And I'd point out he was talking about this for plain old science, all right? This was just the data coming off of microarrays, the data coming off of super colliders, the stuff that was actually happening in the physical world. As we said, what we have now is something actually even more than that, maybe call it synthetic science, where we're measuring not just physical phenomena, we're measuring the phenomena we choose to make, right? We're generating software to generate data. Okay, so we're making the data for the science. We have, in some sense, a data exploding machine. The, the size of our data is some function of the data we start with. Simulation, resampling, optimization, synthesis, etc. And when I look at what the students in the labs are doing and the budgets they're spending at Amazon, it strikes me that the only thing keeping these people from doing more work on more data is how much money they're willing to spend at Amazon or perhaps how many fossil fuels Amazon's willing to burn uh, on their own. Okay, so really uh, uh, our data is unbounded at this point. And so Jim's in the party, right? And he's, he's reminding us that we have to do better at producing tools to support the whole research cycle. So I'm happy to say I've been working in this space um, uh, for some years. Um, and so I'm going to cover three topics briefly uh, in this space and work with that we have done and are doing uh, towards tooling for data science. So I'll talk a bit about data wrangling. I'll tell you what I mean by that, data context, and then uh, data science lifecycle management. OK, we'll begin with data wrangling. This mostly is joint work with the colleagues Jeff Hare and Sean Kandel, uh, who at the time we started doing this work were at Stanford. Jeff is an alumnus of this department, uh, the Computer Science Department at Berkeley, which is how I met him. Um, so the, you know, the elephant in the room in data science, the thing that we all know is there but we don't talk about is, is um, uh, 
that uh, uh, basically it's so hard to get the data you want in the format you want to do the work you want. All right, so here's a quote from a, a user study uh, survey that we did in 2012. I spend more than half of my time integrating, cleansing, and transforming data without doing any actual analysis. Most of the time, I'm lucky if I get to do any analysis at all. So this was a professional data scientist who worked at a um, f uh, contract marketing firm. So they did digital marketing. Uh, and we heard this sort of thing all the time back then in 2012, and I hear it only more now, that 50 to 80% of the work in any analytics project is in preparing the data. Okay, so we did this user study and published it. Actually, the student who did this, Sean Cantel, won an award at this conference for this uh, um, user survey study. Um, at the same time, DJ Patil, who later on went on to be the first uh, chief data scientist of the office of the president of the United States, uh, DJ had a book around the same time where he used the 80% number. We were hearing 50 plus percent. And DJ was talking about 80%. No, Sean Kendall is his name. Uh, and of course, this became such a common statement that Big Data Borat had to retweet it. His quote was, in data science, 80% of time spent prepared data, 20% of time spent complaint about need for prepared data. OK, so that's actually how data science works in the real world. Um, and you can ask, you know, why are end users disconnected from these data sets? Why are they unable to really work with this data, whether they're in the sciences or in business? And the answer at some level is it's an interaction problem. And this is why I worked with Jeff Hare and his student on this. Jeff works in human computer interaction and data visualization. Uh, one of the biggest problems is we're asking people to write programs to clean up their data. Many people don't write programs. Uh, many people who want to work with data would prefer to do more interesting things than write data cleanup programs. But lots and lots of time is spent writing data cleanup programs. So this is one in our favorite, uh, you know, the latest, greatest technology for data science, uh, Python. This is a Panda script to write to clean up some zip codes and whatnot. And it's, it's pretty unpleasant. OK. Um, in the real world, uh, we've gotten better and better interfaces over time. And there are hints of how we might attack this problem in things we've seen before. So consider Google's uh, search box. Some years ago, uh, they started to introduce type ahead. So you start typing Major League Baseball, MLB, and they have this autocomplete feature that does a few things for you. So using the context of where you are, what time of day, maybe who you are, uh, and using data, obviously their corpus of the web and your, your usage logs, they predict what you're going to type. They give you a ranked list from a probability dis distribution of what you're likely to be continuing to type. And they give you a preview of the most likely result you're going to get. So if you're off track, if you were typing the wrong stuff, you immediately know something's wrong. And if you're on the right track, you can stop early. OK, so that's nice. Uh, that's kind of a nice thing. Can we do that to help us write scripts for cleaning up data? Can we do something like that? And this is kind of, it wasn't actually our inspiration, but sort of a metaphor for what we were doing. We call it predictive interaction. So we wrote about this in a paper some years ago. The idea is traditionally, uh, the best thing we've done for this data cleaning problem is to have a domain specific language, a special sub language of your program for cleaning up data. So the one in Python is called pandas. The one in SAS is called the data step. That's from the 1970s. They're just about the same. Um, and in this world, you have your data, which is represented in some file. And then you write a bunch of code. You execute the code, and you get output. And that was kind of the, the state of the art, and in many cases still is. I bet if you walk around Berkeley and you ask how people clean up data, that's how they do it, because right? scientists love their programming languages. So our goal was to lift this into a higher level domain. So what we're going to do is we're going to visualize the data, put you in a visual domain, and let you do visual data exploration. And the idea is that if you're interacting with the data, the um, interactive data visualization can give you feedback on what you're doing. And based on what you do, it might predict what you want the data to look like. So if you point at something in your data set and say that over there, we might get a sense of what you want to do with the data. And I'll show you this in a demo in a minute. Based on these predictions, very much like we saw with Google search box, we're going to take your most likely prediction. We're going to turn it into code. We're going to compile the code. We're going to run the code. And we're going to give you a preview of what you would get at the output if you were to choose that option. So we do a very quick program synthesis, just like I was talking about in the previous slides, to generate you a preview of what if we did the thing that you mean. All right, and if you like that, then you can pick that one, or you can pick one of the others uh, to get the results you want visually on screen. And then we can take that whole thing, compile it back down to the language, ground your model back to the domain-specific language, and compile output data. 
So uh, this all sounds nice. We call this the guide decide loop because the user guides the system to what interests them. And then AI in the system helps predict what the user might want. And then the user has the agency to decide if that's really what they want. So we call this sort of a guide decide loop. It's a way for humans to interact with the AI that's embedded in the tool. Okay. And so we had a paper on this in uh, 2012. I think the date's wrong there. Maybe 2011. Maybe it was 2011. We had a little demo of this called Data Wrangler. It was hosted on a website at Stanford. And it would uh, do this predictive interaction. It would give you immediate feedback. It was kind of neat. Um, it worked for data as big as you could copy in your browser and paste back. So very, very small data sets. Uh, and it was just a little web-based demo, but it was enough for us to get confidence that we really wanted to look after this problem and, and run with it. Um, and so the technology challenge we faced at that point was how to really make this work at scale for real users. Um, how do you make something to be very visual so you're always seeing what's in your data and exploration of data is what drives transformation. You make it intelligent with this sort of guide to side loop with built-in AI to rank and predict what you're going to do. Make it interactive so you get immediate feedback regardless of the scale of the data as to what you might get if you choose different options. And then um, you know, make it in some sense fun. Data cleaning, instead of being horrible, actually this is the moment, this is the time in your work where you really understand your data. You never understand your data better than at the time when you're deciding which parts of the data matter and how to structure it. Um, oftentimes, actually, you forget that later on. You have your cleaned up data, and you just keep using it over time. You're like, oh, that's my data. And you go back to your source data. You go, oh my gosh, I forget how I turned that source data into this nice, clean data set I use. While you're in there really wrangling the data, that's when you're thinking the hardest about what does this data mean to me and my use case. Right? And this happens every time you do this in, in, in any context, in science and business and so on. Um, and so um, that's a blank slide. Uh, and so what we built is we built a company, we raised some money, and we built a company that does this data wrangling uh, process in a variety of contexts. There's a desktop tool that I'll show you. But also, this software will run on data really at any scale. It'll run on-premises with big data stacks like Hadoop and Spark. Um, but it's hosted at Amazon and Microsoft. And actually, at Google, if you use their built-in Google Cloud data prep tool, that's trifecta. That's the results of the research we were doing here at Berkeley. It's an embedding of our software in the Google Cloud platform. So that's pretty cool. They announced this last year. Uh, and I'll show it to you briefly on screen as well. Um, just to give you a sense, you know, the company's been around for a number of years. And I've learned a ton because we're, the software is in use just all over the place in many different use cases. So lots of financial services companies, sort of you know, uh, global banking, um, um, a variety of the IT services vendors that do data cleanup for contract. Healthcare and pharmaceuticals is a place where we see this used a lot, retail and consumer goods, and then in, in some of the government agencies as well. Um, and to give you an anecdote, before we do um, a demo, I want to talk a little bit about what the Centers for Disease Control have been using Trifacta for. It's pretty cool. Um, and this goes back some years, maybe a couple years, to an outbreak of uh, HIV AIDS in Indiana. Um, and this was when Mike Pence was the governor. You may recall, because it was interesting news, they were dealing with this HIV outbreak. And it, became clear, as I'll talk about, that this was due to um, opioid usage and needle sharing and things like this. And um, you may remember the governor had to consult with his religion and his heart to decide to let the federal government come in and do needle, uh, needle provision programs, so they, needle exchange programs, so people wouldn't share needles. So there was, it was a lot of press about that, because politically it was complicated. Well, if you dig a little deeper, um, the CDC uh, went ahead and predicted and identified where this was happening. And if you dig a little deeper, there was a big data exercise that they went through with some uh, federal consulting firms to do this work. And Trifacta was one of the vendors that uh, they worked with to take this data and clean it up. And without belaboring the point, um, they were doing processes that were taking them three months to get the data cleaned up. And they reduced that to a three-day process using the kinds of technologies that I'm going to show you. Um, including, you know, not only is it an uh, increase in performance, but some of the things that they thought were true in the data were refuted by doing a better job cleaning it up. Very often, your analysis depends very much on the assumptions you make while you're prepping the data. If those assumptions are wrong, uh, it leads you to wrong analyses. So this is very common, and the CDC is now expecting to scale this out to other outbreaks as well. And there's a nice quote from somebody here that says, hey, you know, we have to fix commas to decimal points and stuff, which is, you know, the kind of level of boring that this can be if you don't do it well. So I thought I would give you folks a sense of how this works with just a little demo. Um, 
what I'm going to show you is the desktop, the free tool that you can download from Trifecta and use. It runs on Windows and Mac boxes. It's uh, Trifecta Wrangler. And what we're going to do is very quickly clean up some data from the city of San Francisco. So we'll create a new flow. We'll call it the SF Restaurants Data Set or Flow. And I'm going to grab some files that I downloaded from city of San Francisco um, on businesses, inspections, violations. We'll load, oops, we'll load them into the tool. I don't need help, thank you. OK, and it's bringing them in and giving us little previews. And I think um, rather than give you the full use case, we'll just jump into the most entertaining file, which is the file of um, restaurant uh, violations uh, and what kinds of violations you'll see at restaurants in San Francisco. This data is now a few years old. Um, this is just waking up. And so these recipes are the little scripts that users uh, will generate by interacting with the data. So let's look at one. Really, I know what I'm doing. Thank you. So it's pulling the data into the user interface. All right. And immediately, whenever you put any raw file into Trifecta, it's going to do its best to structure the file and show you the content. So this was just a, a, a file on your desktop. It'll take raw text, JSON, CSVs, whatever. It'll do its best to structure it for you. This is pretty well structured, so this is going to be pretty clean data. But even in clean data, you can see some interesting things. So it inferred automatically that there's some numbers, some dates, and some text. Okay, what it didn't see automatically is embedded in the text are more dates, right? So they're the dates that these violations occurred. And I want to pull those dates out into their own field so that I can compare the date of report with the date the violation was corrected. And so this is the kind of thing where predictive interaction comes into play. Here's a date. That's the kind of thing I'm interested in. So I should be able to highlight that date and get suggestions for what I want to do. And the first suggestion says, are you trying to extract that string into a new column? And um, I can mouse over some other suggestions, okay? Um, some of which look better than others. Um, or I can give more examples, and it'll refine the recommendations. Okay, So here's a suggestion that looks pretty good to me. It's pulling the dates out. And notice how not only am I getting a preview of the output, but I'm getting a visualization of the distribution of values that I would get if I took this step. So it automatically detected that the strings I'm extracting are dates. It's giving me a domain-specific visualization with years. Right? These are dates, but it's showing me the year range automatically. I can mouse over this and say, hmm, this looks pretty good. And I can look at the example rows. And uh, they don't actually look right, because look here, the, the 12 is getting converted to a 2. So what if we do that one? That one looks like it might be better. Click on that, now my 12 is a 12. All right, so that's that whole guide to side loop. And every time I interact with the tool, what I'm going to do is add steps to this recipe. Just by pointing and clicking, I'm actually generating a high-level program that I can then compile down to something I can run at scale. OK, so we pulled out these dates of descriptions. We might want to clean out these fields uh, from these rows now that we're not going to use them. So we can select one, um, get some suggestions. Maybe we want to replace uh, some of these things. I like that one. It's going to delete a lot of those uh, strings and so on. So, you know, very quickly cleaning up my data with just a couple of points and clicks and getting confidence along the way that what I'm doing is what I want. Right? So every step of the way I'm getting feedback. Well, that wasn't what I wanted, so I can go back a step. All right. Every step of the way I'm getting feedback that what I'm doing is probably what I want. This looks better. Okay. So now I've cleaned up my data quite nicely. I've got my two dates, et cetera. Now, we might want to know some stuff uh, about this data. One of the things I found interesting in this data, looking at it, was this. There seems to be a category of um, violation that has to do with vermin. Right? And by the way, now that we've cleaned up the data, notice how few categories there are of violations. These are the codes of different violations that we can have in San Francisco right, with uh, percentages of how frequent they are. Before, we had all those dates, and these were all the distribution of this was all crazy. If you don't remember, I can just go back in the script and show you. So originally, before we removed the date violation stuff, if we go back to this step, that distribution had 18,000 categories, right? But now that we've cleaned it, there's 68 categories of violations in restaurants in San Francisco. All right, this is the kind of stuff you want to be doing when you're coding your data. And I'm interested in vermin. How often does vermin happen? All right, um, and so I'm going to count how often the word vermin occurs in each row. So it's a little bit of an indicator column. Maybe we can... Uh, rename this column to verminous, OK? And now I might want to do something like, say, well, for each business ID, how verminous is that business, 
All right, so you know, I'm interested in business IDs, and I want to group them um, by business ID, and um, I want to count up how often each business occurs. And then you can go in here and you can add things. So what I want to add is I want to add the sum of the verminous field to see how verminous each business is. Okay. So that's cool. So now we've transformed the data. We've sort of um, gotten it at a coarser grain now. Each row is per business, right, instead of per violation, which is a very common thing you do in data preparation is you coarse in or, or uh, uh, refine your data. In this case, we coarsened it. Um, and now I might want to do things like uh, sort um, uh, by um, most verminous to least verminous, all right? And now, of course, the big question is, what is business ID 7056 in San Francisco that's had 10 vermin violations? Um, that makes me nervous. Well, I can do um, a join or a lookup with another data set I have on businesses. Uh, we can just go find out what that, um, what that their business is. We look up by business ID in the other data set, and sure enough, uh, here we go. It is, let's see if we're still sorted by verminousness. We are. So this is the fresh meat market on Mission Street. I don't recommend it. Um, but you know, this is some years ago, so maybe they cleaned it up. And we could spend more time on this. One thing I didn't do was say, how long did it take them to, to rectify? Remember, we had the two dates. I could take the difference of those dates, and then I could see what's the distribution of times it takes different businesses to clean up their problems and so on. So we can always go back into these scripts, and you know, I could now, in this aggregation step, I could pull out things like the date differences and so on. So this is all kind of very interactive and fluid, and it allows you to extend and change your hypotheses about what data is useful to you before you go put it in a can and run 700 models on it, right? So this is kind of a flavor of data wrangling. Hope this gives you an idea of the kinds of things that can be done. Can you show us what that code is? Yeah, so this is um, a representation of that code. I can show it to you in our internal representation. It looks like this. This is actually sort of a Pythonic uh, syntax where you have a verb and then you have colon value, you have key value pairs of, uh, of parameters to those verbs. This in turn is then compiled to whatever platform we're running on. So we compile it to Spark, we compile it to Google Dataflow, we compile it to Amazon's EMR. Uh, and so what it gets compiled to one level down is whatever platform you're running on. Okay, so the idea is you get it into a domain specific language and then you use compilers to compile it to lower level languages. This is important for us uh, in our architecture. It allows us to run in all these different contexts. It's been quite nice for us. So this is actually not a data manipulation tool. We don't change any data. We just generate code. This is a code gen tool, actually. Okay. So, you know, the theme with all this at some level was I'm a big fan of data analytics. I'm a data guy, and that's kind of where I come from. But in terms of working on what's mat what matters, to get more value in data analysis of very ki various kinds, you really have to make the whole process to get there much more efficient. And so that's where we spend a bunch of time, and we think there's a lot of value there, uh, and, and we're seeing that in the marketplace as well. So that's been pretty cool, and I've learned a lot doing that um, with a variety of use cases. With that, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Okay, one of the things that I found working at Trifecta at my company was that we wanted to partner with lots of other vendors who work on big data. And we wanted to keep track of our recipes that our users generated. And because we know, you know, a user spent a long time working on this particular data set and then loading it into this particular tool. So we can track kind of interesting use of human capital in an organization in data analysis. Wouldn't it be nice if we knew what everybody was doing in the organization with different data sets, not just in our tool, but in all the tools that we were using, right? And wouldn't it be nice if we could share our metadata with the metadata of the data viz tool that's downstream or of the, the analytics tool that's downstream or of the data ingesting tool that's upstream? Wouldn't it be nice if we all had sort of common places to share? And what we found as an engineering organization was that we had to partner with each one of these adjacent vendors, with the charting vendors, with the data loading vendors, with the data engine vendors pairwise. So all pairs of vendors in the space were doing integrations. Very expensive, very time consuming, very frustrating. What would be really nice was, wouldn't it be nice if there was a place where we can all write down descriptions of the work being done, write down descriptions of the data sets being used, write down descriptions of the users, and share that in some, even maybe not so common way, but just have a place to put that information. If I could start writing down what Trifacta sees, and the Tableau people who do visualization could write down what they're seeing from their users, we could figure out how to put that together later. But there's actually nowhere in the open source data stack to put that stuff today. So this is uh, where sort of data context comes in. Um, so to, to kind of put this in a nutshell, if you look at the open source data science community and you sort of grade it on health, 
done a great job working on data analytics. All right, that's where everybody wants to spend their energy and time. We're starting to do better at data wrangling. Trifact is not the only vendor in this space. I'm happy to say we sort of kicked off a, 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 a market segment. So there's a bunch of competitors in this space. We're doing a terrible job at long-term data management. All right, just a terrible job. We can store bits on disks. Nobody knows what's in your data lake or in your Hadoop cluster, or for that matter, often in your collection of various databases in your organization. So, which leads us to kind of the question of like, what were we doing when we did all this big data revolution? We had databases before. They seemed to be fine. And then we had this big data revolution. What was that about? Well, at some level, it was about blowing up this object. We used to assume there was a database where all the information would be. And that assumption was a lie. There was no organization of note in the world that had a single database. They had scads of databases, and they were all disconnected. And so the, sort of the, what emerged, I don't know if it was any one person's idea, but what emerged was to decouple the functionality of that database system into a bunch of pieces. And then those pieces could be reused by lots of people in various ways. So we'd have a storage layer and various data flow engines and query optimizers and languages on top and schedulers and workflow and ingest and PubSub and all this stuff. And what was super cool about this was that suddenly we had a very agile environment where new players could come in and contribute open source or not open source solutions at these various pieces of the stack. So a group like the Spark team at Berkeley, which was seven or eight graduate students, could write a little data flow engine that could you know, fit in the stack with all these other things and displace a whole bunch of complicated technology with something simple and clean and new. Right, so really neat, great for the community and great for a lot of innovation. Uh, and we saw a blossoming, you might say an explosion, of uh, new tools emerge over the last five years or so, 10 years maybe. The problem with this, of course, is that this is all disintegrated. Right? We've taken a thing that used to be offered to you by IBM or Oracle, it was deeply integrated, and now we've got something that's disintegrated, which sounds bad and in some ways is. So for people who actually want to use all this technology, it's maddeningly confusing and extremely hard to manage. Um, and all of these tools don't fit together at all, really, because they don't have any shared common APIs or context. Right? And on top of all this, just to keep this in mind, the applications that use data are multitudinous already. So these are logos of business intelligence and data analytics vendors. So the Bank of America, uh, one of our customers at Trifacta, told us that they have over 100 approved business intelligence vendors used in the bank. Over 100. And those are the ones that are approved. You know there's lots of people who've gone out and swiped a credit card and gotten their own. So there's crazy town up top. And now we've introduced you know, crazy town in the infrastructure. And it's really uh, problematic. So we could ask ourselves, how are we going to put all this back together? Well, how did we used to do it in the old days? Right? How did people used to communicate all this information across these pieces of the stack in the old days? There was this thing called metadata that a database system would maintain that would let the various pieces of the system record what they were doing and what they had. All right? So deep in that can, there was a place where we went to share our stuff. And it was the metadata layer. And this is what's missing from the big data context. So what is metadata? If you go back to the original, this is Ted Codd's paper on the relational model, 1969. Uh, the metadata in this relation of degree four is very clear. It's there. It's the name of the table and the column names. That's the metadata. The data is all the numbers. What is so hard about that, right? It seems really easy. OK. Well, these, this is data, too. This is a log file from my Macintosh. It's uh, getting old, but it's a typical log file. What's the metadata in this? Are the dates metadata or are the data? Um, each one of these log entries is from actually maybe a different service or application. So there's not a common format across these rows, uh, except that they all have dates. So is it date, comma, garbage? Or do we want to segment this thing out into separate pieces and have different metadata for the different pieces? And the answer is, it depends. It depends what you want to do with this data. This is what we call schema on use, that you're going to impose structure based on what you want to do with the data. Well, what does that mean? That means that we have a relativistic view of the truth. You might think that this data should be used one way. I might think it was used another way. There's not one true piece of metadata about this file. There's many interpretations of this file. So what I want to do is I, I want to record all those different interpretations of this file for use by many people. All right, so the world's gotten more complicated. This is only one of many changes that's happened since Ted Codd's nice paper. A database is not the fact. A database is a bunch of recordings over which we overlay interpretations and models. Right? And I think we all know this. So the world's quite a bit more complicated than it used to be. 
And so our goal in, in doing some research here was not to fill a metadata-sized hole in the da big data stack with something that looks like what we've seen before, but to lay the groundwork for something richer, some notion of data context. How is my data getting used? Okay, and so we spent some time thinking about that uh, and um, kind of came up with an abstraction for what data context might be. Really what I want is all the information surrounding the use of the data. I want to know everything. Well, how might we taxonomize that information? Well, we're going to put it in a system called Ground. I, I guess I'm selling that first. That's the name of our solution. But before we designed a solution, we said, well, what are sort of the categories of metadata that we're interested in? And we, we kind of broke it down into these ABCs, right? There's application context. That is, um, we want to capture what uh, the subjective truth is about the data that is important to you. What's your application view of this data? So for one of you, the log file was dates and garbage. For another view, uh, it was something about particular applications on the Mac and which ones were running. Um, and those different um, representations of the data are the application context. It's how you want to use the data. Separately, we want to have behavioral context. I want to know where the data came from what software tools were used on it, what data was generated by those tools. Oftentimes you have data that's the result of other data and computation. Uh, and I want to know who's used what. So I really want this data lineage and this data usage information. That's kind of behavioral metadata. And then data changes over time. So I want version history. I want to know, uh, you say you have this file. Which version of the file is it? From what date? Um, you know, and, and, and what were the changes? So these are three, we thought, sort of separate cuts of what's the data context. And so we came up with a meta model in which you have sort of the core application model in the center, but for each entity in that application model and for each relationship between entities, there are versions. So that's the la layer C, that's the change layer. And then we also at the layer B are keeping track of usage and data lineage. So what was derived from what by uh, what task and in, at what time. And so what we said is this API is what we're gonna call common ground. It's a, a very unopinionated abstraction. It doesn't impose what's a data set, what's a use case. We don't have any of these names defined. We just say very abstractly, there's these three layers and you can impose your application semantics. But we're gonna give this common three level model. And then above it, we're gonna have an API to various applications of data. And below it, we'll have services that support the storage of this context. And so what we envisioned was that with this common ground meta model underneath it, we could do research on things like storage and crawling and uh, authorization and searching and querying. And above it, we could support and build all sorts of interesting applications that would utilize the context to better use. You know, some of the magic of a tool like Trifecta is that we log everything anyone ever does to their data and we get better at predicting what you're going to do because we know the kinds of things that people do. You can imagine data visualization tools would do the same. They would look at user behavior, they would look at data context, and they would help you generate better visualizations and insights because they would have context about data usage. So how could all these various applications use this data? Well, to start with, we need a place to store it. So this is kind of the vision of ground. And I'll tell you that the research we're doing in my group is mostly focused on uh, how do we store versions of everything over all time? So all your code, all your data, all your models, I want to store that and I want to keep versions of it uh, going back and forth across time. So it's kind of an interesting storage database problem. And then up above, we're looking at this data life cycle. Um, how do we look at data quality, reproducibility, model debugging, model serving, and, and what would they need from this meta model in order to get better? Okay, so this is some of the research we're doing in my team. A quick status report. Um, the ground uh, first release uh, went out this year. It's sort of a server in Java that runs over a database. But to make it easier to use for the everyday data scientists, sort of for the, the person working just at their desktop, we have an implementation of ground that has a different storage layer at the bottom. It's just the Git um, version control system that comes with every, pretty much every, every data scientist PC. And so instead of having a database underneath, we just have a version control system underneath. And that ground model is supported over Git. So we call that grid. And that's something that your basic uh, Jupyter Notebook user could just get going with without even knowing they have it. Right? So you can uh, go look at the code on these things uh, uh, and play with it uh, as you like. Okay, so time is running a little short. I think we're closing at five, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm gonna give you a flavor of a project we're building above ground now called Jarvis. And we won't get time to do it in detail, but this is a project on managing the machine learning lifecycle that a bunch of us are working on. Let me give you a little bit of the context, which in some ways is more important than the solution. Specifically managing data for machine learning pipelines. Okay, so this is a bit of a, a, a specific use case, a very sort of computer science-y use case of data context. 
So when we think about the machine learning life cycle, we think about it having three different phases. Pipeline development, which is the kind of thing a data scientist does, sitting down, trying to figure out a data set, trying to figure out what models to build on that data set and how to generate those models from the data. Uh, training at scale, so if you're at a company like a Netflix or an uh, Amazon or so on or a Visa, you're going to take the models developed by your data scientists and you're going to try them out in production on really big data sets in a test environment right, and see how they do and tune them. And then there's the actual live deployment of that stuff for inference. So how does Visa actually do fraud detection in real time? How does Netflix actually do recommendations in real time? There are servers that take those models and put them in deployment to do inference. So this is development, training, and uh, inference, if you like. And this life cycle spans many time scales. This person is iterating on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. This may be iterating on an hourly basis, and this may change every number of days. Okay? It's across systems. Oftentimes, there's different software actually being used in these different phases of the life cycle, sadly. Um, and almost always different groups of users within an organization because the working styles and the tools are different in these different contexts. So you know, as you go through these things and you think about each of these phases individually, different tools are being used, different tasks are being performed. And not to belabor the point by going into detail, what we really want to do is stitch all this stuff together. Okay, so the big picture, how do we put it together? Um, basically, you want to follow the data and its context through this life cycle. And so what the goal of Jarvis is to, is to help people get their sort of ABCs in order to help people at each one of these stages be a little more disciplined about writing down what they have and what they're doing with it, and try to integrate that into their tool chain in a way that's not too intrusive. To help transit that information across teams and phases so that people in the testing phase can, can figure out why the models they got from the devs are the way they are. Um, and then part of this then is to get people to write workflow specifications, not just write code, but actually specifications of the code. And I'll show you briefly what that means. And then get hooks to execute it in whatever execution framework you like. So you may like TensorFlow or you may like some open source Python tools or what have you, but execution is a separate thing from specification. So we want to extract from the users and track the intent of their tasks, of their pipelines, and then plug into the desired execution frameworks. And all of this with the goal of enriching post hoc analysis. So reproducibility of experiments is something very much in our mind. Debugging of models that are not doing well is something very much in our mind. And along those lines, counterfactual analysis. So can I change the inputs to my models? How will that affect the outputs? And will that help me understand why my models are doing what they do? Okay. So time permitting, I would have taken you through a demo of uh, Jarvis. We don't have time. Uh, but what it would have done is it would have taken you through tweaking an existing model and showing you how we lay out that model uh, and run it. Um, even running the model is going to take a few minutes in the background. So I don't think I have time to take you through all this life cycle. But what I can do is show you a bit of what it looks like. So the example that we did uh, is just a little example of classifying tweets. So we take a, a file of tweets from Twitter. And what we're going to predict is based on the text in those tweets, what's the country of origin? Right, we're going to do that using training data that's been labeled. Right, so we start with this thing, which is a file of tweets. And with it, we're going to split it into testing tweets and training tweets, the way you do. All right, so I want to keep track of the code for splitting the data, which is going to be in a file called split.py. Uh, the parameter fraction, which is what fraction is going to go to test and what fraction is going to go to training. And maybe a, a seed we used for a random number generator. So these are all the parameters that go into an action for splitting the file that generates two artifacts, the output, the training tweets, and the testing tweets. Okay. Given the training and testing tweets, I now take the training tweets, a file called train.py, and a parameter of a naive Bayes uh, classifier called alpha that goes into an action to train a model. And that model gets generated as another file. All right. I take that model, and now I want to test the model. So using a file called test.py and my testing tweets, I take the model, I run a testing procedure, and I get a score. And the score is another artifact I want to log. All right? And uh, I actually may want to do this for many settings of alpha to figure out the best setting of alpha for my naive base uh, implementation, a very typical sort of parameter sweep. Uh, and so we're going to do this for a whole bunch of alphas. So this whole thing in the box is going to get iterated across all these different experiments. Right? And at the end of that, we might want to do that for the, uh, the fraction of split and test as well. You can do this arbitrarily. Um, and at the end of all that, we want to pick the model with the best score and deploy it. So this is what I mean by a pipeline. Okay? And for each uh, parameter, for each artifact in this pipeline, I want to track it over time. I want versions for all these things. And so these little annotations are representations of version IDs. 
So if you look at this thing, there are artifacts, which are the boxes, and they're all versioned. There are these parameters, or literals, we call them, that are also versioned. These are the, the constants you pass into your algorithms. And then there are these actions, which are not stored at all. They're just representations of what we want to do by invoking the code on the data with the literals. Right? And by writing all this stuff down, um, we have, oh, and then we have, of course, our implicit uh, multiple experiments, the parallel fork. Um, writing all this down, we can get an experiment. And in essence, what we're doing is we're mapping the world of experimental machine learning into our ground model. Uh, those sort of uh, three entities, the um, actions, the artifacts, and the literals are all part of the application representation of what we're doing. For each of those things, we're going to have versions in our change graph. And the connections between these things are the data lineage. Right? So the arrows we had in the previous slide will be captured in ground as data lineage. Now, in our lab right now, we're running these experiments on Ray, which is uh, Jan Stoika's group's parallel Python execution engine. So we can run lots of experiments in parallel in a cluster. Um, and here's the code to represent this graph. And I won't go through it in detail. And this is back to coding land. All right? So now we're talking about uh, programmers. Uh, but you'll see for each line of code, there's a box on the screen. Right? So we can express our literals. There's line 10. We can express another literal that's line 11. We have a Python file in line 13, the split.py file. We have the action that puts those all together in line 14 and so on. And this is a very simple sort of workflow language or pipeline language to compose uh, the pieces of the pipeline that you're putting together. And when you write this thing um, and run it, so up to here, let's see, up to here. Yes, up to line 31, it's all specification. Line 31 is the line where we actually execute the model. Okay? And each time you run this model, we're going to record all the versions of all the things you ran and all the outputs it generated. And then, of course, across runs, and this is what I would have demonstrated, we don't have time, if you change anything in this pipeline, it will change potentially things downstream, and we'll version the changes you made and the changes in the output. So every time you run an experiment, we're going to track all that in, underneath for you in ground. So this Jarvis runtime, in essence, is keeping track of all your history. And then it lets you go back through that history and do things like find the best models, compare what changed between models, ask questions like, why am I getting this strange output? What versions of things generated this model? And so on. So it's a lot of um, state management, a lot of bookkeeping um, from these specifications. OK. Uh, and there's a number of research directions. I think the one that I want to focus on for this context is the notion of replicability. So reproducibility of these pipelines will do. So everything you've written down in Python and Jarvis will keep all the history and will be able to rerun for you identically. So you can take Jarvis stuff and you can put it in a box and give it to your friend, and they can reproduce exactly what you did. But what's maybe more interesting is what can we do for people who want to do replicable science? So reproducible science, replicability, where we get the experiment design decisions audible and subject to justification. All right? And so some of the ideas in the community for this are things like pre-registration of methodology, uh, something Mike Jordan pointed me to. So a website called aspredicted.org is a place you can go. And you can write down in English what you're going to do in your science experiment. And what this ensures is that when you publish your results, nobody can say, hey, you've been p-hacking. You've been changing the rules of your experiment as you go, and that's why you found something interesting. It's just coincidence. If you write down in advance exactly what you're going to try, then when you get results, you can say, look, I did what I, my, I followed the experiments of my hypothesis. I got this outcome. It was not um, polluted by my process. My process was what I thought it was going to be. My outcome is my outcome. All right, that's all very nice, but it's all in English. Can we do something here that's more programmatic, that's more of a computational contract, where we can help people write down precisely what their experiments are going to be before they run them, and then keep them disciplined about not following their noses into misleading uh, statistical sort of overfitting. And then beyond replication, there's this idea, sure, it's nice to run things twice. Uh, reproducibility is good. But once you got that going, that's, that's kind of boring. What you really want to do is do different things. You want to take different approaches to find the same truth. So if you believe something's fundamentally true, you want two different experimental protocols that will validate the same result. And so this is what some people have called triangulation. So how can we help people with this process of validating scientific results um, using different methodologies rather than just rerunning the experiments we had before? So I think these are very exciting places where some of the tooling we're building can lead us to thinking about better ways to do science. All right, um, so I won't go on in, in much more detail except to say that you know, we've taken uh, Jim Gray's uh, uh, motivation and, and we're definitely working on it in my group. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>